All right, if you'll join me in Matthew chapter 20, our study in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ continues. Last week, uh, we saw a turning point, quite literally, a turning point in his ministry where he and his disciples had been on the east side of the Jordan River in a Roman province known as Perea, and it has come time for his time. They turned toward to Jerusalem, and he's going to go there for the final time. And as he did so, he told his disciples again how his ministry was going to end. And they were afraid, they were amazed, they did not understand. And, and then almost out of the blue, yet consistent with how they think, uh, James, and Con- James and John came forward with a power play, uh, trying to get for themselves a position of greater power than some of the others, and the other ten were mad at him. So the disciples were kind of in a mess uh, as they start the journey. Uh, and Jesus had to s- kind of level the, their, their hearts again by teaching one, once again what great in the kingdom means. Great in the kingdom of man is radically different than great in the kingdom of God. Great in the kingdom of God is being a servant of all. And he would, of course, be the prime example. And the king is our best example. So now, as the journey toward Jerusalem continues, we're going to see Jesus heal the blind man uh, outside of Jericho. And like most of the times, uh, when we consider the... The, the different gospel accounts, you know, we get the whole truth in the four gospel accounts. And we're going to read and consider some differences that we see in Matthew and Mark versus Luke. And, and, and on the surface, um, we might think that there's a, a contradiction here, but there's no contradictions because there's one author and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the word. And he's given to Matthew and to Mark and to Luke and to John different perspectives. They are eyewitnesses. They have different testimonies about the things they saw and the people they talked to. Uh, There is one truth. There is no contradictions. Uh, So we are in Matthew chapter 20. And we resume where we left off last week. And so we're in verse 29. It says, as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed them. And we need to stop immediately and and get our bearings here. Uh, Jesus is with the 12 disciples. He's with many others who are with them. They're leaving again the Roman province of Perea. They've crossed the Jordan River. They're now in the Roman province of Judea. And it says... They departed from Jericho. That means they're west of Jericho, right? They're on their way to Jerusalem. Jericho was then as it is now. It's a hub for roads. Uh, Roads leading east and west, north and south along the Jordan River met in Jericho. And so what's going on now, uh, again, there's a great multitude followed him. Uh, he, they are joined by, they are accompanied by a multitude of people. Where do these people come from? What are they doing here? Well, why is Jesus going to Jerusalem? For the Passover. And so we have pilgrims, Passover being one of the feasts that the Jews were required to go to Jerusalem for. And so we have Jews coming from the north and from the south and from the east. And they meet in Jericho to go up the road to Jerusalem. So it's quite a crowd. Verse 30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So quite clearly on this road, sitting along the side of the road, we have two blind men. And they heard that Jesus passed by. And so they shout out. And they'd have to shout out to get, you know, people are talking. There's a buzz. They shout out to be heard above the buzz of the crowd. Have mercy on us, O Lord. And the word Lord there means master. They're calling him master, but they're also calling him what? Son of David. What are they calling Jesus? Who are these two blind men calling Jesus? The Messiah. The seed of the woman who was promised through Abraham, 
Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and David. They're calling him the son of David. It's one of the messianic titles. And so they're saying, you're the Messiah. Have mercy on us. Uh, it, it's, it's a proclamation of faith, right? They believe Jesus is the Messiah. And they believe that he has the power of God to help them. Have mercy on us. And we'll read later uh, what, what help they want. Quite naturally, they want to see. And so they believe that Jesus has the power to do that. But we read... In verse 31, the multitude has a completely different heart. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Uh, the, the multitude, hard heart. Uh, they're harassing these blind men who are crying out for mercy. You know, oh, please, hush. Be quiet. You're already blind. Why don't you go ahead and be dumb, too? We don't want to hear you. Really hard, brutal hearts. And they're not, notice that they're not discouraged. The the hardness and the harshness of the hearts of the crowd in no way discourages these two blind men from trying to get an audience with Jesus. In fact, they ramp it up. They want time with Jesus. Verse 32. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Uh, Jesus heard the two men. He cares, and he acts, because that's what Jesus does. He hears, he cares, and he acts. And it doesn't matter the noise level around him. He can hear even one voice crying out to him. Uh, and they, they've called him the Messiah. By calling him twice as they cry out, Son of David, they are identifying him for who he is. Uh, they have his attention. And what, what is it that you'd like me to do? Well, please, would you open our eyes that we might see? Uh, it's a simple request. <laughs> We're blind, we want to see. Humanly impossible, but very simple. Uh, And they're crying out for mercy to the Lord who delights in mercy. And so he touches their eyes. He has compassion. He touches their eyes and he healed them. And now their eyes work just as he designed them to work. He is the Messiah. He is the creator. And now that they see, what do they do? They followed him. Now, let's get some more information in Mark chapter 10, a parallel account. Mark chapter 10, in verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, And a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. So in in Matthew's account, Jesus is with his 12 disciples. They're being accompanied by a great number of people. They've passed through Jerusalem. They're continuing west on the way to Jerusalem, just what it says here in Mark's account. Matthew's account says there are two blind men. Mark's account says there's... One, and gives us his name, Bartimaeus. Is it one or two? Two. But Mark is focused on the one. And what what is just written here doesn't negate in any way what Matthew was inspired to record. Uh, We take the pieces together. Uh, And we also are told now by Mark, not by Matthew, but we're told by Mark what these guys are doing on the roadside. What are they doing? They're begging course they're begging. It's the Passover season. Lots and lots of pilgrims are going to take this road up to Jerusalem. This is prime time when it comes to asking for alms. When you're not in the temple area, you may as well be on the road to Jerusalem. And that's what these guys are doing. Verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, 
he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It gets more personal. We have one, we have his name, and it's in the first person. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus. He's not a pirate. Blind Bart is a pirate. Bartimaeus is in the wayside. He's on the wayside. He's begging. He's with somebody. But he just not recorded in, in Matthew's, or excuse me, in, in Mark's account. And there's a crowd going by. And he's listening to the conversation. And in the course of the conversation, he realizes, whoa, Jesus is in this crowd. Now, to the multitude who are accompanying Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth. He's a prophet. Mighty indeed, mighty in word for sure. But he's Jesus of Nazareth. He's a prophet. But to Bartimaeus, who is he? He's the son of David. He's the prophet. He's the Messiah. There's a different perception. There's a different spiritual understanding in Bartimaeus's heart compared to the hearts of the multitude. They don't yet know or believe that he is the Messiah, who he is. Uh, and Bartimaeus begs for help. He begs for mercy. Is he begging for money, an alm? Is he begging for money? No. He's not begging for any worldly thing. He's asking for mercy. He's asking for a blessing from God. And it's the proper thing. When, when Jesus called Matthew to follow him, and the Pharisees thought, are you kidding? He's a publican. He's a sinner. How can a sinner follow a rabbi? Well, Jesus said, I didn't come to heal the, the, those who are well, but those who are sick. And to the Pharisees, he said, go learn this. And he quoted Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, that says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Pharisees were unmerciful. They did not have the heart of God who delights in mercy. And so Jesus said, go learn this, mercy. This guy's asking for mercy. God hears the cries for mercy. But what happens? And many charged, in verse 48, many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Uh, the, the crowd around Jesus, accompanying Jesus, gets on his case. Tells him, just hush, be quiet. What's, what do you think's in their heart as it relates to Bartimaeus? What's, what's in their heart? They're annoyed. They're annoyed with him. Even though he's a blind man asking for help, uh, they think he's an interruption, a distraction, a disturbance, an inconvenience. Get out of the way. Be quiet. But, again, notice that he's not discouraged. And he cries all the more, Jesus, son of David. And we... And Considering the circumstances, simple words, but really a very great proclamation of faith by Bartimaeus. It's a cry for mercy, number one. He is calling Jesus who he is. He's a messianic title. He's addressing him straight up as the Messiah. And number three, he's doing it with persistence in the face of resistance. They're facing all sorts of resistance they still cry out. That takes faith. Verse 49. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise. He calleth thee. So the, 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 the hearts and the attitudes of, of those in, in verse 48 that charged Bartimaeus to be quiet, the hearts and the attitudes of those people, not the heart, not the attitude, of Jesus. He hears the cry. He will give mercy. He says, bring this man to me. 
And it says, interestingly enough, and they call the blind man and say unto him, be of good comfort, be encouraged. Wait a minute. Either the people who just got done trying to discourage Bartimaeus have had a change of heart because Jesus has a different heart, or these are different people. But nonetheless, the people who go to Bartimaeus say, be of good comfort, be encouraged, rise, get up. Get up and, and come with us. Because Jesus wants to see you. And that's awesome. Verse 50. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. This is the Passover. What time of year is it? It's the springtime. Is it hot or cold? Yes. <laughs> Either. And what does he do? He has a cloak, a garment, a cloak. It must be his most valuable earthly possession because it protects him from the weather, from the rain, from the wind. It's his covering while he sleeps. And Jesus wants to see me, so he throws aside his cloak. Verse 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Does, does Jesus know why this guy is calling out to him? Of course he does. Does he know his name? Yes, he does. So in asking the question to Bartimaeus, remember, big crowd around, uh, in asking the question to Bartimaeus, what is it that you would have me do? Jesus is either testing Bartimaeus' faith or he's putting it on display for his disciples and the whole crowd to see as an example of faith. Uh, Bartimaeus, as recorded in Matthew also, he responds very simply, very directly, and very specifically. Uh, Lord. Now, we lose things in the translation from the Greek to the English. It reads like just the way it read in Matthew. When the two blind men called him Lord, which meant master. Well, the Greek word here in, in Luke, when he says Lord, is Rabboni. It is a, a tender and personal form of the word rabbi. Rabboni means my rabbi. It's very personal, very tender. And that's how this Bartimaeus responds to Jesus, my master. It is my will. You can. It is my desire that I see, but that I might see. You can heal my blindness if it's your will. Underneath all that, I believe, is a a submission to the, the will of his rabbi, his master. But he expressed his desire, I, I would like to see. This man is, has faith, but he's blind. So a question, is seeing believing? No, seeing is not believing because we have someone who does not see that believes. Verse 52, and Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. All right, in Matthew's account, he touched their eyes. In Mark's account, he spoke. What did Jesus do? Touch or speak? Uh, Both. Both. And he says, go your way. Go the way of your choosing. Go your way. Which way do you want to go? That's your choice. Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And I think he knew Bartimaeus' faith, and he asked him the question to put it on display to the 12 disciples and to the multitude that were with them. This is a man of faith. And he vouches. He vouches for Bartimaeus' faith. Uh, But he says, your faith has made the whole. Uh, What does that mean? Well, hold that thought. We'll get to it in just a minute. But 
Jesus speaks, and when he speaks, Bartimaeus receives a gift, a gift of healing. His eyes are healed, and he now sees. And now that he sees, not I shouldn't say it that way. Uh, he probably would have anyway, but he does now see, and now he follows Jesus. So, when Jesus touched, when Jesus spoke to Bartimaeus, and his eyes were healed, what were the very first things Bartimaeus saw? The face of Jesus. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Uh, and what, what was his choice? When, when Jesus said, go your way, what was Bartimaeus' choice? To follow Jesus. Now keep, well, we don't need to keep a finger in Mark because we're going to go to Luke 18. But before we do that, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. If you're born again, you've had a Bartimaeus moment, but not quite in its full. That is yet future for us. In 1 John chapter 3, starting verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us who are unlovely, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's going to be a time when we see Jesus face to face. In verse 3, every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Because we know we're going to see Jesus face to face someday, that affects how I live today. What I say, where I go. How I interact with my wife, how I interact with my children and grandchildren, how I interact with all of you, because I know I'm going to see him face to face. It governs how I live today. Meaning, I follow Jesus. Right? Now, let's go to the third account in Luke 18. Luke 18, starting verse 35. And we read our Bibles carefully. And it came to pass that he was come nigh unto Jericho. What does that mean? He's coming near to Jericho. He hasn't come yet to Jericho. Matthew's account, Mark's account, he's beyond Jericho. He's west of Jericho. So is he east of Jericho or is he west of Jericho? Which is it? Well, it turns out that's the wrong question. The right question is, which Jericho? Because there is an old Jericho and a new Jericho. The old Jericho is in ruins from the days of Joshua's conquest. And to the gospel written to the Jews... Matthew, he's west of old Jericho. The old Jericho is the point of reference, and he's west of the old Jericho. Now, at this time, there's a new Jericho. It was a strategic location, a hub of many roads. And so Herod the Great built a new Jericho. And in the gospel written to the Romans, Luke It says that he is approaching. He's east of the new Jericho. So all accounts are true. He is west of the old Jericho. He is east of the new. There are not contradictions in the word of God. If we think there's a contradiction, it's because we don't understand something yet. We keep praying, we keep reading, and the Lord shows us these things. All right, verse 35 then concludes... 
A certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And of course, in Mark's account, we know that this certain man has a name, and his name is Bartimaeus. Uh, Verse 36, And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Once again, notice the two differences in how Jesus is referred. To the multitude, he's Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet. To this man, Bartimaeus, he is the son of David. He is the prophet. He is the Messiah. And so faith is in Bartimaeus' heart. It's not in the multitude. If you're going the way of the multitude, you might be going the wrong way. Verse 39. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. Uh, Circling back up to verse 39. They that went before rebuked him. We have a multitude of people. We have a crowd of people going up this road. The people who are up front paving the way, if you will, they're the ones that rebuked the two blind men and told them to be quiet uh, because it's, it, it's if they're, they're annoyed. They're an obstruction to be cleared. We can't have any obstructions on this road because we're going to Jerusalem. Jesus is with us. We're going to Jerusalem. And you're, just because you're blind and begging for mercy, stop. Please stop. Really hard-hearted. But, you know, Jesus doesn't see this man as an obstruction or a distraction or a disturbance or an annoyance. He doesn't see this man as men see him. He sees this man as God sees him. He's one of the lost sheep of Israel. And he, Jesus, is the good shepherd. He's come to seek and to save the lost. And here is one calling out to him. And he hears it quite clearly. And of course, gives him the the gift of sight and the gift of salvation. Verse 42, thy faith has saved thee. In Mark's account, Jesus made him whole. To be made whole is to be made whole physically and spiritually whole to be saved. Verse 43, we get something a little different now in Luke's account. And immediately he received his sight and followed him glorifying God. After Jesus spoke, and Bartimaeus, we know, uh, received his sight, and so did the other guy, and received the gift of salvation, he followed Jesus. Now, in Mark's account, Jesus said, go your way. Go your way. The way you choose to go, go. What way did Bartimaeus choose? To go with Jesus. Where's Jesus going? Jerusalem. Has Bartimaeus and the other, have they seen the temple? Apparently, the temple was really something to behold. No, they're going to Jerusalem. And they're going to be able to participate in the Feast of Passover. And they're going to see Solomon's temple. They're going with Jesus. It means that. Did it also mean that they're going to follow Jesus as a disciple follows Jesus? Uh, Yeah, I think so. I think it's both. Their choice, follow Jesus. Now, the rest of that verse says, And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Bartimaeus followed Jesus, and he's glorifying God the entire way. Who can heal a blind man but God? Right? Jesus, I know you can heal me. I'm crying out for mercy. Hmm. What's that make Jesus? Does he understand? Not completely, but he has faith. And he cried out for mercy. He received it, and he is glorifying God. But then we see the people that were traveling in the crowd... 
all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Uh, The people who both were annoyed and those who came alongside to encourage the blind men, both of them, all the people there, saw Jesus heal two blind men. Touching and speaking. And they erupt into praise the Lord. Which is only appropriate, A, because the blind have received their sight. And that's one of the things in Isaiah chapter 35 that God through his word foretold his people that the Messiah would do. He would restore the sight of the blind. Only the Messiah would do that. Well, they're eyewitnesses of it. Besides, you go up to Jerusalem and I think it's like Psalm 120, 121 through 132-ish are called the Psalms of Ascent. Pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem would sing these psalms and their songs of praise. They erupt into praise of God because of what they've just seen. And so they no doubt had some energy going to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now they're Now they're ignited. (laughs) <laughs> they are absolutely on fire about what's going on. Uh, but their hearts are still an issue because they, they wanted these two guys to, to be quiet and get out of the way and just leave us alone. So there's still heart issues. Maybe part of, and this is also, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to put myself in their, in their place, understanding the, the history of the thing and the, the people and how this thing ends up. Uh, maybe they're, excited that Jesus of Nazareth is going to Jerusalem again and his enemies are there, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and hopefully the Romans, and he's going to confront them. This is going to be best Passover ever. But they've also been forewarned through the prophet Isaiah that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, brought, he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. If they're anticipating a great showdown, it's not going to happen. That's not God's plan. And maybe as it doesn't happen, they turn on him. And we do know that everyone turns on him. Everyone turns on Jesus. Right now, they're praising him. But in Mac, Matthew chapter 20, Mark chapter 10... And Luke 18, at the end of all those chapters, we have these two blind men on the road to Jerusalem. And we have Jesus. Jesus touched. And Jesus spoke. And Jesus saved, made whole, if you will. And Jesus had compassion. And Jesus was meek and humble, and he was approachable. He invited these blind men to come to him. He was available to help them. He was willing to help them. And he worked to the glory of his Father. We see Jesus' heart. We see Bartimaeus' heart. We see the hearts of the multitude. And it's really... What an awesome God we serve. Bear in mind the context. Where is Jesus going? To Jerusalem for the final time. What's waiting for him in Jerusalem? The cross. And he who knew no sin being made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The culmination of this first coming is awaiting him, and there's suffering unlike anyone has ever experienced. And of course, we know that that crescendos a bit, if you will, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he sweats, as it were, drops of blood. But I'm thinking right now that his heart is probably kind of heavy about what is lying ahead. He may be a little, if he were, if I was in that place, I'd be a little preoccupied with what's going on. Is Jesus preoccupied? Doesn't sound like it. Doesn't look like it. He has the time. 
He, he can be interrupted at any time. He has the will and he has the power and he has the love to touch and to heal someone who's crying out for his help. A lost sheep. He always has time for a lost sheep. He always has time for a hurting sheep. He always has time for a dirty sheep. He's never too busy to minister to one person. And praise God, because that's all we are. We're all one person. And he is our Rabboni, my master. A term of endearment. And when I cry out to him, I know that he hears me. And I know that he cares. And I know he's going to act. And I know he's going to do it in his will and his time. And it's all going to be perfect. But I know these things. And so can you. So should you. Even in the, even in the most difficult of, of circumstances, we know. And maybe it just seems like it's overwhelming. What we're facing is overwhelming. Especially if we look into the future. Jesus, is he looking into the future for the, what awaits him in Jerusalem? It would be overwhelming. Well, we, we have a tendency to look beyond the end of our nose to next week, next month, next year, and we start to get crushed. But we don't have those things yet. We have today. God has given us today. So in all of our trials and our tribulations, maybe relatively minor, but bothersome nonetheless, maybe enormous, We need to ask ourselves one question. And it should be asked when we wake up in the morning. Can I do this today? Because that's all I have. Yesterday's gone. will never be there again. Uh, tomorrow's not here. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. Uh, I have the present. I have today. In this circumstance, can I do it today? Yes. It's manageable because our Rabboni, our good shepherd, is with us and he hears and he cares and he's leading and he'll get us through just one day at a time. You see, Jesus was never... This, this account tells me that Jesus was never inconvenienced or annoyed or too busy to not hear the cry of one person and to stop and to minister to the one individual need. Who is great in the kingdom of heaven? Let him be the minister of all. What does that tell us? Uh, we should never be inconvenienced or annoyed or too busy to help anyone that we can. Because Jesus would and Jesus lives in us. We're his witnesses. We're his ambassadors. He was approachable. He was available. So must we. But the hard reality of it is can that be said of a lot of his ministers? Ministers of Christ, can, they, can that be said? Well, sadly, at least from my perspective, as I see things, uh, sometimes a, a ministry can get so big and so prominent that the minister becomes unwilling or too proud to stop and minister to the need of one person. I've seen it. And it's no doubt throughout the history of the church. And when that happens, in the heart of the minister, the ministry has become greater than the Lord. The ministry has become the object of worship instead of the Lord. And when that happens, it's fruitless 
regardless of the worldly numbers involved, it becomes fruitless if Jesus is not Lord, if he's not the one being ministered to and served. And when that happens, and it's, it's sad, it's, when it's sad, uh, when that happens to a minister, he becomes unchristlike. Got a, a mega church. Now they hire bodyguards to keep the people away from the pastor. And they, they say it's because of security or because of protection. He doesn't have time to deal with the individual people. That's why we hired associate pastors. There's something wrong there. That's not Christ-like. Recently, someone said, uh, I need a new jet. I need you all to donate a whole bunch of money so I can buy a new jet because I don't have time to mess around with the riffraff that flies on commercial airfare. Whoa. Heart problem. Heart problem in, in the minister of Christ. We're called to be approachable and available. Jesus was always approachable. He was always available. A minister of Christ is to be Christ-like. And whosoever is in the kingdom of God, let him be your minister. If you are in the kingdom of God, you are a minister. A minister of the gospel in the sphere of influence where the Lord planted you. In that sphere of influence, be approachable, be available, be willing. All right, so... Lifting up a little bit in our perspective, this account. Two blind men, one of them named Bartimaeus, on the road to Jericho, on the road from Jericho uh, to Damascus. No, to Jerusalem. The road to Jerusalem. Uh, we see the heart of Jesus. We see the heart of Bartimaeus and the other blind man. And we see the heart of the multitude that is accompanying. Jesus. And so this has been recorded for us. And it's now time for a heart exam. And it's individual. First person, where am I in that passage? That's the question each of us need to ask. Where am I in that passage? Am I one of those accompanying Jesus? Well, they don't have any compassion. They don't care about the needs of others. They don't want to be bothered or interrupted. Is that my heart? Holy Spirit, is that my heart? Or maybe we have a heart like the blind men who are healed by faith, heard the gospel, cried out for mercy because I, woe am I, I am a man of unclean lips, born unto a people of unclean lips. I fall short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. The wages of sin is death. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when we said, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, there was a call. Jesus calling. Not the book. That's her heresy. But Jesus said, come. Come to me. When Jesus called us to come to him, did we respond immediately like Bartimaeus? Did we throw off every worldly possession? It lost its importance in comparison to Jesus? I didn't. I didn't. I'd wrestled with the whole notion for six months before I finally did. I did not respond immediately. But Jesus kept inviting me. You, you know, speaking of me, you know you're a sinner. You know you fall short of my glory, so come to me. I want to. <laughs> Until I realized, wow, I am really a knucklehead. You know, this is just pride. This doesn't make any sense at all, so I came. Have I 
Beg to see. Well, my eyes work just fine. Uh, Beg to see what? To see things as God sees them. To see people as God sees them. To see Jesus as the word of God reveals to us. And when we believe, we receive sight. And we receive life. We become new creatures in him. And then... When we're told to go our way, we make the only rational choice there is and to go with Jesus, to follow him and not ourselves anymore. And as we go and as we follow him, to sing praises, glorifying the Father for the amazing thing that he had done in us. So everyone here and everyone out there <laughs> has a heart like the crowd accompanying Jesus or has a heart like Bartimaeus and the other blind man? Which is it? Well, if you, in your heart of hearts, or as, as the Holy Spirit is speaking, if the heart, excuse me, the, the Spirit is teaching or saying to you that you really more have the heart of the people that are accompanying Jesus than Bartimaeus who's following Jesus, well, maybe today... Maybe today is the day that you surrender to this amazing love and this amazing grace. Just give up and stop accompanying Jesus. Stop playing church and start following him. Decreasing that he can increase. Wanting to be conformed into his image being governed by the word of God, being led by the spirit of God. Don't accompany Jesus, follow him. Today is a perfect day to do that. Today is a perfect day to truly believe and to be made whole. And if you already have, and you are, follow hard after Jesus. He's going to the cross It's a place of suffering before the glory. We're promised things like that a little bit, but it's okay. The Lord's with me. What can man do against me? If God be for me, who can be against me? He's already defeated my enemy. Uh, That would be the devil and death. I'm more than a conqueror. I have victory over those things. So it doesn't matter what happens in the world. And the Lord's going to be with me, leading me through the things. Lamentations 3. We read in Lamentations 3 corporately uh, toward the end. Lamentations 3, verses 40 and 41. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. May that be our prayer, each of us individually. May we search and try our ways, compare them to his ways. And when our ways are not his ways, to uh, to turn from ours and to follow after his and lift up our heart and give it to the Lord. The earth, the fullness thereof belong to the Lord. Everything on this planet belongs to him. Except man's heart. And it's his will that every person would give him their heart. But every person must so choose. And in that union of two wills, glorious, glorious. So, I'm just thankful that the Lord I follow is not like me. He can be interrupted. Sometimes I'm not real happy about being interrupted and This is a very convicting passage of scripture for me. (laughs) I want to be approachable. I want to be available. I want to be a minister slash servant. And I pray that that is your desire also. Jesus is our example, is he not? If you'd stand with me, please.
Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to interrupt us, to speak a truth that confronts us, a truth that demands a decision. I believe it or I don't believe it. I'm going to surrender my life and be governed by that truth or I'm not. Thank you for the revelation in your word about our Rabboni and his love and his grace and how he sees us not like other people see us. Father, I pray that you would increase our faith, that we would all have the faith like Bartimaeus and the other blind man to stand in the face of resistance from families and friends and co-workers and all those people who are saying, oh, just be quiet about this, Jesus. But we would not be quiet. We would continue to speak all the more because they so need him just as we so needed him and someone persisted in our resistance toward them to continue to tell us the truth. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the work that you've begun in us. You said you're going to finish it. I believe it. Lord, give us the heart of our Rabboni. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.